Hello, welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Dan Demers, CEO and co-founder of Cinchi. You may remember the name because back in the year-end review show, I actually said it was one of the two most exciting companies I've seen in, in the space in 2020. And now that's 2021, I'm pulling back the curtain on that and giving you an opportunity to check it out for yourself. Cinchi is a next-generation data management platform that employs a type of architecture known as data fabric. This is, in my opinion, rather revolutionary to how we manage data. And yes, don't let the word data bore you because this is a very interesting conversation. And with that, here's my interview with Dan. Dan, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. So Dan Emers of Cinchi, tell us about Cinchi. Sure. So uh, Cinchi eliminates integration. It's as simple as that. And integration today consumes half of the IT budget of every company on the planet. Uh, so it's a, it's a really big deal and we're really excited about it. And uh, that statement, though, will sound uh, way too good to be true, but that's exactly what we do. Well, it's funny, you know, you say that it's for people who are familiar with your website or your logo. I mean, you, you took a page out of Salesforce's book. When Salesforce first launched, it was software with a big red X across it. You know, they basically say you don't have to buy software. They were the innovators of services and software. You have a big red cross across integration and lines of smoke coming off of it. And for the record, yeah, I mean, I think the stat was something like 50% of all IT budgets go to integration data management. Is that about right? Yeah. And that includes things like APIs and ETLs and reconciliations. And don't forget all the byproducts of data being fragmented. Uh, so when you think of entire categories like uh, master data management and data quality and data governance, these are all just simply a byproduct of the fact that data is everywhere. It's nowhere. It's copy and paste. And it's not anyone's fault. It's just how we've architected systems for, for 40 years. But yeah, I think 50% may even be an understatement. And I definitely saw that with my own eyes when I used to work in a, in a bunch of big banks. So and I'll tell you from personal experience, this is often of anyone who's ever had to do any kind of data migration, even from one CRM to another, has seen the the ironic notion of like, where you look at the software and you say, hey, this is fantastic. This costs less than or about the same of what I'm doing currently, but does all this wonderful stuff. So I want to migrate to it. And the next thing you know, you have a twenty five to $50,000 bill to move over to a software that's going to cost you $2,000 a year. Right. There's a really weird incongruity to that. So tell me about your experience and what you did before this and how what led you to the formation or foundation of and what, what was the problem you were trying to solve? Well, my co-founder and I, we actually met while working in the in the industry close to 15 years ago now. We were at, at Citigroup at the time, uh, Cap Markets uh, Technology. That was my background. I was uh, building, designing, coding, supporting uh, some pretty complicated systems at some pretty big banks and mostly in the capital market space, uh, but global in nature. And uh, just had the... I'm, kind of a lazy guy. I like to find shortcuts. I don't like to do mechanical things over and over again. So I uh, was just always on the hunt. Smart, not Smart. lazy. Yeah, Smart. Smart. Thank you. Yeah. Don't, don't yeah. besmirch me, okay? I was <laughs> yeah. uh, always looking for shortcuts and was able to find some creative shortcuts. But as you deliver one system and then move on to the next and then move on to the next, you start to have this realization that it's like deja vu. I'm doing the same thing and just over and over and over again. Even if the business context is completely different, I could be building a, a front office trade ticketing system with straight through automation or a derivative valuation uh, determination and a client presentment system or a billing system, or it could be anything. But the IT work is so much simpler. It's, it's crazy. I have to build my abstraction layer. I have to build some APIs. I have to uh, design a data model. Like it's the same thing just over and over and over again. And that's where I guess the realization that it's all because of the fact that data is embedded inside of an application. That's the, the flaw. And it's misaligned to the realities of data. Data is all connected. And it's hard to visualize that because we're so used to a world where data is, is siloed and it's subservient to an application. Like you mentioned the idea of a, a CRM migration, moving from one CRM to another CRM. Well, the fact that you have to do a data migration is, is kind of a ridiculous thought because why was it ever in the CRM? What is the CRM? The CRM is an experience. It's an application. It's, it, is, mm -hmm. it shouldn't own the data. The data is your asset. That's what is perpetual. That's what lives forever. Apps are disposable. They come and go. So the, but originally, let's be fair. I mean, when the original yeah. innovation of software, everything was, okay, we're going to build this thing, to, to, this software to do X thing, and we're going to warehouse data to get it accomplished. So it was kind of a, it was a utility first version or view of the universe of we're doing this to accomplish something and the data yes. is just something we need yes. to get yeah. there. But yeah. then that, the problem is, is that how many different silos, anyone in finance knows this problem. If you ever have to rekey something into two different systems, it's a failure, in my opinion. But that is the common experience. I am constantly inputting the client's same information from one system into another into another. And that's just because they were all developed to basically deal with utility. Exactly. Yeah. They're 
their point solutions. And you're right, it wasn't as if people were consciously trying to do the, the wrong thing. It's just, that's just how it was. And it, so the way I, I see it is, this is just the evolution of, of technology. There was no other path <laughs> to enable this because code uh, was used to take manual processes and automate them and streamline them. But we had a realization that this code needed to have a memory just like a human needs a memory, needs to remember information. So uh, a human may write it down uh, pen and paper. Code needs to write it down on pen and paper. So hence the, the database. And the use of that memory uh, grew in terms of complexity. And we started to get into externalizing configurations and making you know declarative and basically having a goal of less and less code and more and more data, more and more config driven. So it's almost like the code came first and the code invented the idea of data, but it invented it in the context of its of its purpose. And the code is always intended to solve a very specific purpose. I'm going to onboard a customer. I'm going to do KYC. That's what the code is doing. Uh, so it's it's originating the data to solve that problem. Uh, but and this will maybe sound a little bit wacky, but it's almost like the the data is now maturing and growing and becoming self aware, where it needs to break free from the applications because mm -hmm. uh, the uh, so you've heard the expression that software is eating the world. Well, software is code. So uh, coming back to your no software uh, claim. <laughs> from before software is eating the world but uh it's the data and metadata that's actually now eating the software it's eating the code yep so uh, i like to say it's the datification of of code and part of that is because the realization that whether you're onboarding a customer or doing kyc or uh, booking a trade uh, you're dealing with some type of customer information well it's the same customer that should be stored once and used many but not stored every time it needs to be used Yep. And, you know, there's been a long road to get to the realization of the data being the core asset over yeah. top which the software sits, right, as opposed to the other way around. We can probably owe some thanks to, to the innovation of surveillance capitalism through the likes of Google and Facebook. They talk about the masters of taking large sets of data and, and turning it into profitable, actionable items across multiple verticals. Like they didn't pioneer it, they sure as heck perfected it. So we started off in a world with silos, which makes sense. And then in the effort to get that data out of silos, we eventually created things like art of, like like APIs, application protocol interfaces that allow two systems to talk to each other. But those are point to point, right? So the problem would be that I would, you know, for every time I wanted to build a connection between multiple systems, I'd have to create, like if there's three systems and I want them all talking to each other, that's three separate points of connection. So, and if I, if I, have, if I throw a fourth in there, now it's four, five, six, right? So it's an, it's an end to the end squared problem, right? So it's exponential, which is not scalable when you really think about it. Yeah, if you had 500 applications, that's 500 silos. If you wanted total connectivity, that's 124,000 and change integrations. If you had total connectivity, which of course no organization can afford, so therefore they have a disconnection. They have a limited intelligence as a result of kind of incompleteness in their in their in their fabric of knowledge, <laughs> and that's just the realities of it. And APIs are actually a very powerful idea when you use them appropriately, which is for uh, code. Because uh, mm -hmm. if you think of like, why did we even create APIs? in the first place because um, APIs have been around for a long time. Like today, the API is largely associated with like a REST endpoint uh, with, a, with a, mm -hmm. a, a pseudo standard, but you can go back over past uh, technological generations and there was, there was always programming interfaces uh, for applications mm -hmm. to use, right? But why did they even come to be? Well, we moved from uh, having all the code in a single uh, location, like a monolithic code base where everything's together, realizing that you can't do development at scale. You need to federate that. So you need to break an application into mm -hmm. smaller discrete pieces. But wait a minute, these applications need to interact with each other. So initially, maybe I'll do uh, a sim link and embed the code from your application into my application and compile it alongside of it. And then we mature to, okay, actually, why don't you pre-compile it and I'll reference it as a library, but I'll deploy that library as part of my code and then realize that that's also inefficient. You want, uh, ultimately what you want is my code to be able to call your code uh, with pointers, not with copies. It's mm -hmm. passing by reference, not by value. And so think of APIs as, as a code fabric. It's an interconnected mm -hmm. network of code where you're avoiding the code copy and paste. And where people I think get confused is they think APIs are great for connecting applications. Well, applications have services and, and logic, but they also have data. So why wouldn't I just use API for data as well. And that's where it, it changes, right? Doing a, a data exchange over a REST endpoint is, is still data integration. It's over an yep. API, but it's still data. You're, you're getting a slice of data. You're going to store that data. You're going to, you may as well do it over an ETL. It's just more timely or data streaming. It doesn't matter. So yeah, what, yeah. what we're doing really is, is applying the same principles that went into the you know, the goodness of APIs and applying that to data. So you have your code fabric for, for logic and you've got your data fabric 
for data. Before we go to data fabric fully and fully explain the concept, yeah. I want to just set the stage for one more thing first. Okay. So, you know, we've gone from these silos to one of the things that was more popular recently was the concept of data lakes, which are just large dumping grounds for stru structured and unstructured data that then you say, hey, great, I'm going to layer an API over this. And then anything that needs it can basically dip in this lake of data and basically pull that out. Can you speak as to the limitations or the, or the hurdles with that kind of structure versus what yeah. we're going to get into in a second? Yeah. So first of all, the data lake isn't where you're originating data. It is um, a repository for storing copies of data. And although there's a, there's been a lot of confusion, especially in the earlier days, it's starting to become more clear to people that the data lake's intent is to essentially not force you to or organize and normalize all of the information as you bring it in. You can dump it in in raw form. It's it's knowing that you can organize it later. That's the whole idea is it's a repository to dump raw copies of data from systems, whether it's batch or real time as frequently as possible. So first of all, it's not curated. It's not organized. You're getting the data represented in the source systems representation. So you get all the duplication. You get different representations of the same information. You have all these issues. You can't basically, it's hard to do joins. Like It's all just fragmented, disconnected data with data quality issues uh, all over the place. But it's also... Uh, um, it's, a, it's a copy. It's a read-only repository. So at best, it's going to enable you to do analytics at best. It's not going to allow you to d deliver technology faster. Uh, you don't use it as your foundation for building systems. Whether you're buying or building a system, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, you're still going to have an app-specific data store. And the data lake will be an output of that, an additional integration point. It's not going to take away your integration. It's good from the standpoint of it kind of finally takes ownership away from the vertical. And yeah. that's great. And I mean, for anyone, unfortunately, a, a vendor that shall not be named working with my dealer has recently been dragging heels massively on a data extract simply because they know that it's part of the migration. So, I mean, it's uh, there, was a, there was a good picture I sent the, uh, the CEO, the, the, the president at the time. I basically said, you know, it was, uh, it was a guy scratching his head pondering, if I have to pay my vendor to access my data, is it really my data? And that is unfortunately a very real problem. So let's talk about the concept of data fabric. Explain what it is and how it kind of solves for for these problems? Yeah. First of all, I'll start by saying data fabric is uh, a bit of a marketing term, and you'll find that there's different interpretations of that, not only within different uh, vendors in the world, but even in industry analysts, if you talk to a, a gardener versus a, a forester. So what I'm going to share with you is, is my viewpoint on, on what the fabric actually represents. And, and I'll use the word fabric to explain it. If you actually picture, I don't know, take a, a sweater, for example, which is interwoven threads uh, that you may have a, a blue thread and the red thread and having that be interwoven to create a, you know, a single artifact. Well, in a world where data is fragmented, the ability to weave together an interconnected view, whether it's a view of a customer or a view of an employee, uh, you're weaving the fabric and your existing systems, like maybe you have some data in Salesforce or Dynamics or some homegrown CRM and different business lines may use different things. To be able to create that interwoven view, you need the loom. You need you need the, the data fabric to, to create that. So the data fabric is actually a software that allows you to basically create a connected view of your information where the information is linked, it's not repeatedly copied over and over again. So it has a lot of parallels to the maturation of uh, data virtualization and master data management kind of coming together, but uh, with persistence and caching that enables use in operational use cases, uh, not limited to analytical use cases. Yeah, I mean, it was when I first, when you guys first demoed it, and I'm not sure if you remember the demo and just, just how much you broke my brain, in that demo, I found myself struggling for analogies to try to wrap my head around the concept because it was unlike anything else I'd seen in terms of how data gets managed, right? Because as we described previously, you have, you know, the dumping grounds of structured unstructured data, you have API calls between things from point to point. But you know, I think the closest analogy I came up that made sense to me, but it's not 100% accurate, is almost like an operating system for data in itself. And it's like your, for lack of a better term, your air traffic control for all this data. You have a real-time view of all this data and I can hook up my Salesforce to it, You know, have whatever data I want in Salesforce, if maybe even all of the entire data model pulled into, or not pulled in, but linked through Cinchi yep. to give me one view of all the data sorted based on type and then be able to push that data anywhere I want to any other connected program and have you guys basically, again, just be the connection. It's almost like you're the point, be you're the point between the APIs directing things in a much larger, larger means as opposed to a point to point connection. Yeah, exactly. You have to think of it as a, as a network. Uh, just think of how the internet works. If you, if you get a new iPhone or Android device or a new computer and you bring it home, what do you do? You don't, uh, and let's say you want to use that device and send five of your friends an email. You don't, you don't build five APIs. You don't, you don't run five ethernet cables. <laughs> you do one thing. You, you connect uh, that device 
to the network, to, uh, to your Wi-Fi network. And mm -hmm. through that network, you're now connected not just to your five friends, but to billions of people, billions of devices. And all you've done is one thing. It's a beautiful design. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the internet is not the, the first network. There's, you know, social networks, there's telephones, there's lots of examples of that. But for how we've managed information, we've never used a network-based architecture. It's always been point to point. Uh, every time you bring a new application into your into the enterprise, you're going to run wires, uh, these APIs, these ETLs, whatever technology. It's a wire per interaction. Why can't you just plug it into your network, connect it to the Wi-Fi? <laughs> That's the future yeah. of, of applications is their, their plug and play. Yeah. And for the record, thank you. Cause you know, for acknowledging my analogy, because it took me a while to wrap my head and kind of create that and make sure that it was, <laughs> it was resilient enough to stand up. So the fact that passed your test, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Secondly, it's kind of, it's interesting because I'm reminded of the concept of Metcalf's law, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but the everybody else, it's basically the value of a network is a compound factor of the number of nodes on the network. Yep. So therefore, you know, if you have the world's first fax machine, it's worthless to you because no one else has a fax machine, <laughs> right? Whereas if you have the world's 1 million fax machine, it's worth a lot more to you because you can reach out to 999,999 people. Now, fax machines are just a simple example, still using lines. And for kids who don't know what fax machines are, I apologize, just Google them or have your parents tell you about the dark ages. Sadly, they still exist. But that said, you know, I almost look at this as every company in itself then almost benefits from its own small microcosm of Metcalf's law. Right, because for every success in software that I want to bring in to basically do a function, basically now the value of, of Cinchi or the value of this data fabric is exponentially larger because the amount of time to get data, you know, I'm not starting with a fresh data set. I'm not starting from zero anymore. I'm not doing a mass import of, of names and email addresses as a starting point. It's quite literally, I'm going to pull from the API, I'm going to look at the data model on the API, connect. Oh, you need this, that, and the other thing? That's already in the data fabric. Guess yeah. what? I go to that in data fabric and connect you to there and suddenly full access. Just fall off your chair. That is not something, it sounds to, to non- People, the people not working on this kind of sounds like a logical thing to do. Taking a lot of time to get to the logical thing to do, quite honestly. Well, I'll tell you, I realized that when uh, so I have three, uh, three kids, three boys, and uh, trying to explain uh, what I did before was like an impossibility in terms of the immense complexity. But when you explain, I had this realization that explaining to them how a data fabric and how a data network works, it, it's, it's obvious to them. <laughs> Like, uh, and if, if I try and say, so imagine if you had all of your data connected and it was never duplicated and you had applications that were, they came and go and what they did is they provided experiences, but the controls were in the data. The data was its own product. Data is the application essentially. But now let's start to take the data and put it in all these artificial silos. And every time it crosses a silo, let's make a duplicate copy of that. And let's, don't forget, let's now add in reconciliation. Like if you, if you try and add in the complexity that we live with, they would laugh at you. <laughs> so, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it's an interesting perspective because uh, me having been in the industry, like I've lived that. So it's it's like a, an unlearning <laughs> journey more than it is a learning journey. It's kind of like the sum of unintended consequences. No one meant for it to be this complicated. We're trying to solve a problem. And in the solving of individual problem, you know, it's like, it's, yeah. it's a tragedy of the commons. We created this massive mess and doomed society forever <laughs> to, <laughs> to this giant mess, right? Because yeah. everybody was doing the rational thing for themselves yeah. and for the need that they have. And, and it's yeah. still, and I'm going to share two stories. One is, um, you know, I passed along the video of our demo to a number of colleagues who are in technology. And one of which I think actually reached out to you guys and did a demo. And, you know, when he got back, I'm like, what do you think? His response was, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little bit angry that we never thought that no one thought of this before, because this is the way it should have worked. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. And then the second one, is I think part of the problem for why we got here is I'm not going to place it on the technologists, right? I think the technology guys know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's more so the people who basically oftentimes get to manage those people, right? And very recently, I had a conversation with a firm where they were talking about how they're onboarding this one product and another department needed another function that wasn't serviced by that product. So they talked to another vendor. And when you looked at it, it was 90% overlap between these two. Right. And I basically, I'm talking to the head of technology who's frustrated about this. And, and they're like, I'm like, so what was it they actually needed to action from this information? And you know, they said like, okay, so it's in vendor one. Why was not, why did no one just say, take an API feed out of this, slap it into sales? Force because you're already using it and use the reporting engine to do that, or just dump it into an Excel spreadsheet. Like you could have, like you don't need a separate vendor for this, but too often, and I'll say this until corporate cultures internally start to understand the value and how data gets managed and how it can flow from point to point to solve problems without necessarily going to get another solution and having to duplicate all that, we're going to continue to have these problems. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's honestly, it's, it's a lack of, um, 
And again, I don't think they're doing it on purpose either. It's uh, like people have been saying that data has value for a long time. That's not like this new revelation where just suddenly today, oh my God, data is valuable. It's the new oil. Uh, it's uh, That's been there for, for a long time. But look at other assets that have value. Look how hard it is to copy currency people, intellectual mm-hmm. property, governments put controls to limit that. Like, uh, so there's reasons for this. It's not, it's not randomness. It's anything of value should demands a certain level of, of respect. <laughs> uh, it well, has to be thought of as the asset. It's the first class citizen. It is the center of your universe. And uh, that's a paradigm shift. You, uh, it changes how you see everything. It's kind of like a matrix moment that you have to go through. Absolutely. And, you know, I've been on, I remember one, one panel I sat on once and, you know, a very large institution talked about how, oh yeah, it's so valuable, so valuable, but you know, it's, it's a lot of challenges because there's a lot of, you know, lack of cleanliness and all this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting back, I'm like, I sincerely hope you're not looking for sympathy because you realize that your entire institution created this problem. And it's one thing for you guys to, to I actually said, it, one of the things I said was, I, 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 you know, blame the guys from 40 years ago on these legacy systems, fine. Like they were doing what they were, but the fact that you were still doing this two to three years ago, yeah. is inexcusable is inexcusable like this is the reality is if you if you truly valued like you said if you value the asset my god would you put controls on it for quality assurance yeah for sure and uh minimizing duplication of that is one thing to guarantee quality that it has integrity but absolutely like one of the things that uh, although now i say it a little bit differently i used to say don't be data driven you want to drive your data because your your data is a disaster <laughs> you, you have to help it out <laughs> you, you have to fix it and uh these days i now say what you want to actually be is intelligence driven not data driven because uh data driven implies that you're like your fingers and toes you don't uh, use your brain you just listen mindlessly to the data what you really want is intelligence and in order to do that you need autonomy in uh, both people and systems but that's that's a whole different level but the, the point is you have to take the action it's not going to fix itself the data is not going to no. self-repair sadly well, and that's, you know, I, I often wonder with some of these teams I talk to where just like, they talk about, oh, it's going to be too much work to get done. But it's like, this is still necessary and it's still going to be necessary next year. And like, you can't keep kicking the can down the road. Like, you, you're, you know, luckily, at least now we have tools like yours and others that, you know, makes the extraction of these things easier, which mm-hmm. then in turn makes the cleanup of these things a lot easier than they used to be, yeah, right? Yeah. Like how hard is it to run queries to basically look for people with identical names or SIN numbers? It really is not that hard, but nevertheless, so that's, that's us waxing philosophical about data in general. Let's, let's talk about the actual experience of, of what's happened here. So one of the things that caught my attention with you guys was the speed at which you sold into a big five Canadian bank, which frankly, in my, this will be 170 some odd episodes by the time this airs. That's happened twice before, okay? <laughs> like within that short a period of time. So I was like, okay, something legitimate's happening here. That's pretty impressive. So that's why I take a close look. Talk to me about the reception you've gotten from, from institutions you've dealt with, mm-hmm. problems you've solved that you can share, and just how daunting the problem would have been without you. Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, we've had to go through an evolution. Um, uh, not too many years ago, uh, just a handful of years ago, we were just a couple of people. And like Today, we've uh, done a bunch of funding rounds. We're growing and scaling. And in Canada, for example, we have most of the major banks across multiple business lines. We have uh, large wealth and asset managers. We have close to 100 credit unions that are using the platform. We have a good amount of traction in a short amount of time. But uh, if we go back to the early beginnings of that, when we were first selling, we were a couple of uh, crazy folks <laughs> uh, promising uh, the impossible. And quite frankly, we had to kind of change the problem a little bit to show faster delivery of essentially point solutions as the, the foot in the door. And uh, using the datification of code, uh, which is a huge accelerator actually, as that initial uh, kind of foot in the door. So the value prop is better, faster, cheaper delivery, whether it's in the context of regulatory compliance, which I have a lot of experience in or other things. But hey, you're always more hunt. of that coming, my goodness. Oh yeah, for sure. So, you know, people are genuinely uh, interested in, in investing for things that are going to take away uh, cost and time uh, on individual solutions. And then by using that to enter the organizations with that instant acceleration, that's where we then saw the expansion because the value prop is one that magnifies, like you you talked earlier about the network effects of data, like the, the more your data is connected, the faster you go, the, the more intelligent you are as an organization. So that's where we started to see those that expansion within the early first customers. And, and today we have the, the traction where we can explain, you know, what is the actual value proposition? The value proposition is you spend half of your budget on, on integration. We make it so that not overnight, but over time, you can have basically uh, get back that IT capacity and solve your data accessibility and your data intelligence, all these other, other challenges, your data control issues all together by doing one thing, by moving data into the center and having data be the application. It is, it is the product. So 
the more traction we have behind us, the less friction there is in front of us, if that makes any sense. <laughs> but I also go a little bit further to say what you've also done in addition to that is you've done this all in a very low code environment, which I know you're moving towards more towards no code with that, yep. which lets the likes of me, who's not necessarily a neophyte, but can't code to save his life, but he can read a JSON file, lets that actually fall into the realm of possibility for me to leverage a technology that otherwise, you know, back in the day would have required an actual C a computer science degree to wrap their heads around. Right. So the delivery of it, I think, is incredibly valuable in that not only are you, you talk about shortening developer cycles in terms of not having to spend them all on, on migration. Well, the implementation of which you allow people to integrate is also got to be shortening developer cycles substantially as well. Yeah. And the shortening of, of cycles is the result of simplification and the simplification makes it more accessible to people because technology has always been like as a, as a business stakeholder, you always get frustrated. You're at the receiving end. And uh, like people talk about democratization of, of data or even more broadly of, of IT, but inevitably that is the future, right? So every technological innovation adds a layer of abstraction and simplification that makes it more accessible mm -hmm. to people. Like today, everyone uses a computer. There was a point in the past, yeah, yeah. computers were not usable enough to make it so that, you know, you and I would have no idea what to, what to do with it. But now they're simple. And that's the same thing with building technology systems and business solutions is it's getting simpler and simpler and simpler. And I, I like to think that we're playing a big role in that by removing a lot of the need for coding and not so much low code, like code generation behind the scenes. It's it's the datification of it, turning it into data, turning it into configuration yep. and harvesting metadata and some other creative ways that we're doing that. But the more we can simplify that, the more everyone becomes a builder. And that's powerful is when as a business leader or a business stakeholder is technology is there to enable you not to restrict or impede or impose. So that's what this ultimately does is it, it enables self-service, not just reporting, but self-service everything. Well, I mean, not just self-service everything. I think it, the addressable market for who these things can service increases exponentially. I mean, I'm I'm a big believer that we are at the early cusps of seeing an entire generation where everybody does some form of development and coding to some degree, right? Because I mean, the simplest example is the likes of Squarespace or Wix, right? Like before, I think back to back in university, I had to build a website as a project. It was all HTML coding. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it looked like garbage. You know, like <laughs> now it's like, people are like, well, how much should I be spending on a website? I'm like, this starts at $8 a month. Can you type in the word? Yes. Can you upload a photo to a drive? Yes. Congratulations. You can build a website. Like right. it is that easy. And, you know, going further down the channel to something like bubble.io, which I've taken courses on. And I was literally, you know, I remember after the first class where I had to go in and build a small little application and I caught myself like 15 minutes into the actual building of the application, just saying like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like I'm literally like, you know, this would have two years ago been, or maybe not two years ago, but a little bit further back been infeasible without, without a large knowledge of code. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'd say, you know, what you're doing has a little bit more complexity to that. But I also envision a world where you get to the point where it's like, hey, just give us your API logging credentials. You guys suck in all the endpoints. And then suddenly it's just like, we think that this maps the way this way, click yes, <laughs> right? Like, and ta-da, you're not, you're within the realm of reason of that. And that's that's something that would have, when people who are now afraid of their iPhone can start wearing, can start actually building their own solutions, we, we crossed right. the threshold. We crossed a Rubicon. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think the a lot of the energy around uh, the acceleration and low code and no code has been around building those end experiences. But uh, the data challenge has been largely untouched by that way of thinking. So you you can build you know fancy screens and skins, but uh, if you want to take your Wix page and make it data enabled, maybe you want to build uh, an FX trading platform <laughs> and use Wix as your skin. Wix ain't going to help you too much, right? Uh, no. So what's the Wix of the of the middle and back? <laughs> and yep. That's a powerful combination because basically you've got data and the controls at the data layer, and then you've got skins. So you pair those two things together and you have like delivery at light speed that is accessible to everyone in the world. That's the trend. And that ain't, that ain't going to reverse itself. That's going to continue. Well, I mean, I, I I completely agree. I think the future, and we're kind of we're diving into the uh, to the micro microization of microservices. I mean, the reality is is that everything is going to be an API call or something that calls that API and, and sits over top of it. That's pretty much what's going or, on. I mean, for I've even services had, though, not for data. For services, not for data. Data yes. still have to has to be it has to be managed. But I've, I've literally had conversations with companies where it's like, okay, are you going to you going to take that tool and build an entire platform out of it, or are you just going to build a API endpoint and let people ping you right. with other services? And it's just like, what yeah. do you think we should do? I'm like, do you want to compete with these twelve players in this space who are enormous, whatever? When you provide one function, or do you just want to be, or do you just want to capture them all their clients? And it's like it's it's like a no brainer to me. It's like you can it used to be you have a you have a service you have a service but you don't have, or a product you've been on the company right. 
at this point, it's like, no, the product becomes the company to some degree. It, it can literally build a company off a calculation engine if it's if it's robust enough. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the breaking things down to be increasingly specialized is an unstoppable force. So the Absolutely. future is composable. It's uh, it's we're all going to be a bunch of kids playing with Lego. And one day I may play back this to my son, who's only six years old today. And, <laughs> you know, by the time he gets to that stage, maybe like, you guys had to do what, when? I don't understand. You didn't just snap I things together? What, integration? what are you talking about? Like, this is what, but I don't understand. This is, you know, in Minecraft, I can actually build this stuff now just by putting blocks together. Like, it's, <laughs> it's going to be to that level. So before we wrap up, I got three questions for you that I ask everybody. The first is, if you had one wish for something you can change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Good question. Stump simple one. Stump simple one. <laughs> I think it would be for people to become aware of the long-term consequences of our approach to data, not just in business, but even in society. Mm. <laughs> and uh, like w- one of the original thesis of our company is that we think that in the future, people will get control of their data. In fact, regain control of their data because we used to have it Please. before it became digitized. So like our, our whole strategy, our go-to-market is by eliminating integration, you're in eliminating the duplication where it can now be treated with a respect as if it were a currency, intellectual property, or money. And that's how you're going to get data autonomy for individuals and, and frankly, for companies, because companies own data too. But a lot of people just don't have that connection. They don't have that realization that the way that we architect systems is actually the root cause of a lot of the things that we see in society that we don't like, the age of disinformation, the lack of integrity and accountability. is it's A lot of that is directly tied to that. And I think it's going to be very exciting when people wake up and, and make that connection. And we start to really accelerate the movement towards data autonomy. And it's going to not only make businesses more efficient, but make society a heck of a lot better than it is today. Yeah, it's um, interesting the timing of this because on Tuesday, uh, the uh, my fifth part of a five-part series on open banking aired. And boy, did we hit this point over and over and over again about the value of individuals' data. It should be accrued to them. And this is almost, you know, for lack of a better term, this should be a right. This is, you know, this is property ownership rights we're talking about. And if we create our own data, we should have the right to it. The difficulty, I mean, we can have that right. There is a difficulty in the cleanliness and extraction of it currently, which for the benefit of everywhere, everyone, not just the consumers, but the people hoping to basically work with those consumers to sell them stuff, the better, the cleaner we can get to, to this, the, the better we can abstract all this, the better we can do all this, the more value it's going to be for the entire ecosystem. For sure. Yep. And I have another podcast coming up with a company that's looking to build a, trans, a, double, a two-sided marketplace for that. So that'll be an interesting conversation too. The second question for you, what's been the biggest challenge in the company to where it is today? I think it's the um, the bigness of the vision <laughs> and getting people to, to kind of buy in and believe it. Mm-hmm. And so we've had to uh, adapt our entire sales process to eat the risk and so we do like a, pr- a proof of value to get started because quite frankly, if, when I was on the buy side and some vendor was coming in and, and saying what I'm saying, it'd be, it'd be a hard pill to, to swallow. I have to see it, to believe it. I have to experience yeah. it. So learning that lesson is we've now ingrained that in the in the culture of the company. So we we show, we don't tell. And that's like our upfront message is don't, we're, we're at the end of the day, we're a slimy vendor sell, selling you our propaganda. <laughs> don't believe anything we say or show or any you know, PowerPoints and promises are irrelevant. It's at the end of the day, we sell a product that either works or it doesn't. Do you want to try it? <laughs> it speaks for itself. And that was a challenge. And it still is today, actually. It's much yeah. easier just to sell an app for that. <laughs> just act like every client's from Missouri. Right. The old show me state reference. There we go. Only Missourians got that. I got a couple of those listeners. All right. The last question for you is what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and gets you up every day to keep on fighting the good fight? So for me, I've always just been, as I mentioned earlier, the hunt for shortcuts and acceleration. I love when I have a creative hack and, and enable a faster path to an outcome. So I love doing that within the company. And I love the fact that our technology is very centered around doing that for our customers. So it's the removal of complexity. Like the, the name Cinchy is a play on the word cinch, which means simple. So that's what actually gets me excited is, is just eating complexity. <laughs> and that's, again, that's another element of, of a, the company's culture that we're trying to ingrain in everyone is that's our job. That's our purpose is to, to eat that complexity for the customer. Yep. And I thank you for it because as you do that and make these tools accessible to smaller fish like myself, my life only gets better and more efficient. And whereas you say like to eat it, I like to destroy it. <laughs> Let's just say that much. <laughs> anyway, so Dan, thank you very much for this. I wish you nothing but continued success. Uh, big fan of what you guys are working on. And uh, I suggest anyone basically has any inkling of a data management problem or any or any desire to grab a hold of the data and actually start doing great actionable work within their business, take a good look at what you guys are up to. Cool. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Excellent. My pleasure. Take care.
So that was my interview with Dandemir. I hope you enjoyed that. As I said, it is one of the, truly one of the more exciting technologies that I've seen in the last little while. So take that to heart because I see a lot of technology. <laughs> As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever it is your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.